So I'm talking about quantitative root analysis and the construction of root models. And root analysis and root modeling is something that's been done for quite some time now. Um, but I think there's some really exciting future directions for it. Um, so the aim of this talk is to critically examine some common functions. There's certainly not all of them, um, but just some of the common ones I see in the literature over and over again that people use in GIS to generate uh, root models, uh, which are always least cost paths. Um, the assumptions these functions make uh, and their strengths and weaknesses and how um, archaeology might uh, modify and develop uh, custom functions or functions or custom ways of root modeling to more accurately reflect what we know about the diversity of human travel across the landscape. So why does this matter? Well, why it matters is because we can now do quantitative root analysis. This isn't just putting out a leak cost path as a sort of hypothetical scenario, um, we can actually measure with statistics whether they match known roots, if we know where the roots are. Of course, Upper Paleolithic stuff in Africa, we don't have any record. It's, it's still there. But um, there are many occasions, uh, not just where I work in the world, but in other parts, where we do have the preserved roots. And of course, in historic times, we often know where they are exactly. And so we can start testing, isolating and testing individual variables to understand root choice and what variables were important in the past. So if you think of nowadays, we love fastest routes. We all travel fastest routes all the time. I mean, it's not to say that sometimes on a Sunday you don't go for a nice walk, but but we just we're constantly going the fastest places everywhere. If you if you ask Google Maps how to take you somewhere, it'll default to the fastest routes. A lot of GPSs help us get there faster. And when we get home from work, we certainly get annoyed if it takes us 20 minutes of extra traffic to get home. We just love fastest routes. So if people in the future were to study us, they would just see our preoccupation with speed and time and not wanting to waste time and and might even tie it into broader themes of our Western culture about wasting time and time is money and all this. But anyway, other cultures have different ideas. So um, we can isolate these uh, root choice variables by um, picking them and root modeling them perfectly. This isn't to say that when I model an, a least cost path that's based on time, I actually think the people did that. I'm just testing, did they? And to how much does it match? And is it statistically significant? But of course, the results of this sort of analysis is only as good as the model that's constructed. If the model's faulty, the results will be faulty. So um, there's three um, ways of quantitative root analysis. Um, the earliest one I found, I only just learned about this actually a few months ago, um, it's buried in this French journal, uh, Temse, I'm really bad at French, Temse Spaces de la Home Society. Um, and it's from 2005, and what um, this author does uh, is look at roots, known roots in Cyprus, generate least cost paths, and then um, use something called a V coefficient. I'll explain in a second. The second one is uh, this paper here in Journal of Archaeological Science that came out last year, um, where it's looking at Roman roads in Spain. And um, in their case, they don't have the actual roads, but Romans like to leave mile markers everywhere, so they pretty much have the roads. And, and then my own paper on quantitative root models. So um, as I said, this one, it's, uh, what it does is they, have the, the known, they know where the roots are, then they have the least cost paths, they overlay, uh, this author overlays a series of different sized grids, just artificial grids over top, um, and then the, uses this V coefficient technique that Hodder and Orton explain in their um, volume in 1976, which is um, you count uh, the number of squares that has uh, population A, in this case, um, it would be the actual roots, and the, you count the squares that have the, um, the second. Uh, population, in this case the root model, and then uh, you can do statistics this way, comparing them to see if they're the same population or not. So it's kind of clever, actually. Um, this one here goes about quantitative root analysis, like I said, by uh, taking advantage of the Roman habit of putting mile markers everywhere, and then they just uh, measure the distance between their uh, least cost paths and these mile markers um, along the roots to see if they match. Um, but this isn't testing the statistical significance of these matches. So, I mean, it might match 8% of the time or 20% of the time, but is that actually statistically significant? Does it matter? Or would any random thing actually matter, um, match that much? And that's where mine sort of breaks away from these methods. It's 
um, comparing the lines themselves and then adding the sort of statistical significance to the matches. So um, I convert my least cost paths into point shape files um, where there's one point per raster square because at the end of the day that's the resolution of my data. I could throw more dots in there but they're meaningless. Um, and then I measure the distance between these points and the preserved Holloway segments. Um, which is not as tedious, tedious as it sounds, because there's always um, select by location and other tools, buffers and whatnot. Um, and then I generate a population of random models that have the same specifications, the same number of points, the same minimum point spacing. And then I compare my least cost path route model to um, these random, the population of random models um, using a two-tailed z-test to see if um, the rate of overlap that I got with my least cost path is significant or if any randomness would actually match that much. Um, and the reason I use a two-tailed z-test, some people um, wonder about that, is because I'm not only interested in is it positive, but because I actually want to understand root choice. Um, if it's negative, that's also informative because it tells me that whatever is positive should be working against that variable. So it gives me some hints when I try to think of future models. So this is an example um, from my thesis of one such uh, model where it's um, the easiest route model run between uh, across two different um, survey areas in the North Jazeera of northern Mesopotamia. And um, what you see here is these lines are the preserved hollow ways that have been digitized by Jason Err at Harvard. And then the squiggly lines here are the um, least cost paths, easiest least cost paths between each site and every other site. And then I've just highlighted in red where there's, they overlap. And, um, and I find this is useful too because um, sometimes I have quite high matching rates, but like here where you can see it's, it's actually just crossing perpendicular and of course well, it has to overlap if you cross, right? So ones that actually like line up, um, you know, um, a more round. So you can, I can check for that and I can see that. So it's just, um, it's just a nice additional step. So this is just um, dead basic cost distance plus cost path link and run through the cost path function of Esri's arc map. Um, and then I incorporated both slope and land cover into the, the cost surface. And um, the answer in this case is that um, the random population overlaps the Holloways about 10.9% with a standard deviation of 0.3%, which means that um, my root model is significant, exciting, um, but in the wrong direction. It's actually worse than throwing random stuff at the screen. So yeah, 8.9%. If I didn't do this, like, I could say, oh, it matches 8.9%, and you can see like, where it lines up sometimes, and okay, yeah, not there. But actually, yeah. <laughs> So what goes into a root model? Um, so obviously, slope is something that everyone likes to, to throw into root models. That's dead easy. Just take a DEM, slope, easy. Um, but terrain is also really important. And uh, I put a little red asterisk on that. You should stay for session three and hear about that. Um, but there's other things like boundaries. Like if you're at a time period um, where you have really strong political boundaries where maybe people couldn't cross into certain areas, um, that would be quite important to factor in, uh, give it really high cost value artificially or to whatever proportion you feel is appropriate. And possibly visibility. Um, there is an example. Um, forgetting the name, um, someone who did this work um, looking at uh, routes in, I, I think it was Iceland, and with cairns. And of course, when you, you have a cairn system that helps you navigate, then visibility might be important to consider. Um, and then, of course, you have the relationships between these costs. So um, what is the relative difficulty of different slopes? Is a 45 degree slope half as hard as a 90 degree slope? Probably not, but you know you have to think about these things. And then um, the relative difficulty of different terrains, like how much harder is it to walk across um, a bog than grass, which again we'll get into later. And then um, the relative importance of boundaries, if applicable. Uh, my people are right on the edge. States come the next time period. Um, and then also between each other, like, like how do you weight all these different variables against each other? And maybe you have other cultural variables you want to tie in. So it's, it's really important to think about um, who is traveling in your culture and how are they traveling? And we'll get to that um, more a bit later. So here's um, just four really common functions I've seen in the literature all over and over again that people use. Um, you have the, the cost distance. Um, 
function in Esri that you run through a least cost path. Um, and this one, it's, uh, it's quite easy. You're just adding and dividing by two, so an average. And if it's a diagonal movement, then uh, you might recognize this as the square root of two. So you have unit one and one unit, and then the diagonal, right? So Pythagoras. Um, and then uh, over here, this is a little really complicated, but it's actually just a bunch of coefficients that deal with um, how hard different slopes are. Again, this is just factoring in slope and slope. And across all of these, that's factored them, except for Esri, which doesn't explicitly factor anything. Um, slope is definitely function. And yet, we know that there's these other variables that are important. Um, so, yeah, so this is um, it's just literally adding up cell one, cell two, um, and dividing. This is just taken directly from the help documentation. You can find it online um, if you read it, and then sort of through the deck here. Um, this one here, um, it's like Esri. Um, I should mention this is isotropic, so the cost of going uphill is the same as going downhill if the slope is equal, um, which you may or may not agree with, and you should think about that when using it. Um, this is also isotropic, so um, the cost of going uphill is the same as going downhill, which you may or may not agree with, and therefore should may or may not use this. And um, and then you get into the anisotropic ones like grass, is our walk, which um, isn't as complicated as it looks. So you just have um, the, the different letters A, B, C, and D uh, correlate to um, Nismith's rule as modified by Langmuir in 1977. And it's based on um, actual walking and observations um, in how difficult different slopes are. So uh, going uphill up to about 12 degrees is a certain cost, and then after that it gets much harder. Uh, and then downhill, the same thing. It actually gets easier um, to a certain point. The ones you go downhill really steep, it actually is quite difficult. Because um, you don't want to fall down on your face. Um, and with Tovo's hiking function, we have um, an is anisotropic thing. It's, it's symmetrical, but you have this little modifier that it finds to account for um, the downhill. It, sets the peak just before um, the downhill. And so you have this the same effect where it's easier to a certain point, And then once the downhill gets steep enough, it gets a bit harder. So um, something that um, uh, another person working on it's called Kondo has come up with before, and he speaks at the CAA sometimes, is um, this idea of like, these anisotropic models are great and everything. Um, Nysmith here, the founder of the Scottish Mountaineering Club, and Tobler here who's apparently quite tall. I've never met him, but I'm, I hear he's quite tall and a big person. And, and all these people, I mean, they, yeah, they're made fantastic functions. They're very good for them, and they're very good for the mountaineering club and everything. But are they really analogous to our people who are wandering around with this family right there going between their seasonal migrations? Um, and that's something to think about, actually. Uh, I thought it was a really good point. So um, various things you might think about uh, when you make your own route model. Who is traveling? Like I said, are you, is your population a bunch of fit people like we are today, perhaps? Um, or actually, because you talk to your paleopathology friends, you know they're covered in parasites and diseases and they're arthritic at 25. And um, actually, that might impact movement a bit. Um, or, you know, hence the ill or disabled, which um, they might not be considered a network. Or are they fam entire family groups? Maybe what you're looking at is seasonal migration. I don't know what you study. Um, so like the Bakhtiari tribe I showed before, where it's everyone's traveling, children, grandmothers, whatever. Are they walking? Of course, all these are like walking. But I mean, we know people travel all different ways. They, they go on the back of a donkey, which fortunately for me, because my people might use donkeys, actually are really quite similar to humans, so that's useful. But they might be on a horse or a camel, or they might have a wagon with them, which wagons make slopes really difficult. You, don't, you want to stay on shallow slopes. Or um, if you, I don't know, if you're much more modern, studying Victorians or something, maybe they have a bicycle. Um, and they might be on a boat or sailing or, or even using a combination of these methods. And, um, and then you have to think about the factors that would have been important to these people. So like, for the, these people living in, um, Monteverde, slope was clearly not a problem. They quite enjoyed putting handholds into the sides of the cliffs and living on the sides of them. Um, they weren't running around the valley bottoms between their sites. Um, but for other people, in fact, I argue most people, slope probably is important. Um, was time important? It may or may not be. For my people, I've found that generally it's not. 
does become significant in one case study or in one time period. Um, is distance important? Are they trying to avoid taxes or tolls? Do you have the evidence in your historic text if you're working in a historic time period? Um, do they have to get permission b before passing through territories? This is something I've tested before in the um, with the third early third millennium in northern Mesopotamia that actually people just needed to travel between centers. They didn't have to worry about permission from every small village. You could just completely bypass them. They weren't important. And that has implications about the power extent at this time period just before states. Or maybe your culture has other variables that are important. It's, it's going to be culturally specific. And of course, um, the other thing is people can travel in many ways in a single uh, journey. So this is actually just taken. I was in the British Museum two days ago. For fun. And um, there's a, a gallery on Nineveh. And there's, it's just two relief panels. But in just the two relief panels from Sennacherib and from the North Palace, you can see people, actually people kept, um, dragging carts like we would expect to see a horse do, with a bunch of logs on it, and people marching with their horses, and just walking like normal, and trudging up hills, carrying things, and dragging massive siege equipment, and um, boats in the marshes of Iraq, and you know, over here, next king with his little shade umbrella, in a cart with his horses, and there's another one where they're holding an umbrella over his head with the servants attending him. So, I mean, we know these things about the past. We have these things. And so it's just thinking about that and incorporating them into our, our um, root models by just trying to understand the different costs that are associated with this. Are they hard boundaries to so make it some sort of infinite cost? Um, or is it softer? So, um, so I'd argue that instead of just chucking slopes into um, these functions, that we should be adding um, land covers through uh, something called terrain coefficients that will be talked about later. Any known boundaries, perhaps visibility if it's important, these are all things that are easily uh, modeled, and then it's up to you to think, to try to generate a number and relate it that will be specific to your culture. If they're walking between cairns, it'll be more important for visibility. Mine, probably not so much. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then again, who's traveling? So talk to your friends in paleopathology, try to get an understanding of how um, the skeletons that are the people of, that you're actually studying, what, what conditions do they have? How would that affect their movement? Um, would it make soft terrains really difficult, for example? Um, and then uh, anything else that's specific to your culture? Um, I don't think there's any limit, really, to be honest, in what we can model but I might just be early career and enthusiastic and positivist. Um, so, uh, and then I was just trying to see how, how you can do this. I, I, I quite like RG, ArcGIS's least cost path function just because it makes no assumptions. You can just sort of add all these things together in a really sophisticated cost model and just chuck it through the least cost path and see what happens. But of course, it does have um, isotropic movement rather than anisotropic movement. So that's interesting, and I don't know what to do with that. That's just sort of where I'm at right now. Um, so thanks to my supervisors and people who helped me and fund me. So, and thanks for listening. <laughs>